Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Alistair Blanchard. I'm the uh, Paul Eliadis Professor of Classics and Ancient History uh, here at the University of Queensland, and I'm going to be chairing uh, this evening's session. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to this evening's seminar, After the Plague, Insights from Ancient, Medieval and Early Modern History. Uh, tonight's seminar is brought to you by the School of Historical and Philosophic Inquiry and the Faculty of the Humanities and Social Sciences uh, here at the University of Queensland. I'd like to begin this evening's seminar by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of all the various places in which we're meeting this evening um, and to pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. These days there's a lot of discussion of the challenges of returning to normal. But as far as we're concerned on this panel, this misses the challenge. The challenge in the wake of COVID-19 is not how do we return to normal, but rather how do we return to extraordinary? That is to say, how do we make our world not like before, but better than before? How do we seize and capitalize on the opportunities presented by COVID-19? History has much to teach us here. Plagues have always beset us. COVID isn't the first and it won't be the last. But what is striking is how often in the past, in the wake of death, we find a tremendous cultural rejuvenation. As new ways of thinking emerge, new artistic responses are made that attempt to process what has happened. We see in the aftermath of plague tackled in art, in architecture, in literature, in the various stories we tell ourselves about ourselves. To help explore these issues, we have a distinguished group of my colleagues here from the School of Historical and Philosophic Inquiry. Together, their expertise covers over a thousand years from the sixth to the 17th century. The format of today's seminar is that I will invite each speaker to give a short presentation in turn, We'll then have a discussion of some of the issues raised uh, before turning it over to you, uh, the audience, for questions. Um, for those of you who are using Zoom for the first time, you'll see that at the bottom of the screen, there's a button marked Q&A. Um, uh, please, if you have a question, type your questions. They can be uh, submitted at any time during uh, the presentation, um, and we'll endeavor to answer them uh, towards the end of uh, this evening's seminar. So without first, further ado, let's plunge in to our discussion of plague. And tonight, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Amelia Brown. Uh, Amelia is a senior lecturer in Greek history and language at UQ, and her main area of research is post-classical Greece and Greek culture, especially in the era of late antiquity. Uh, she's currently writing a book on the religious habits of ancient Greek sailors in the Mediterranean and how they shaped the development of ancient Greek culture and religion. But tonight, it's her expertise in late antiquity uh, that we are calling upon, as she helps us navigate the devastation of the 6th century Justinianic plague uh, and its aftermath. So without further ado, I would invite uh, Dr. Brown to give her presentation. Good evening. Thank you very much for that introduction, Alistair, and uh, thanks to the audience for tuning in tonight. Now, I'm just going to give you a brief presentation about the challenges of plague and also rioting, uh, lack of funding that occurred in the sixth century, so around 1500 years ago, uh, but have a kind of eerie similarity to some of the challenges that we're facing today. Now, the Emperor Justinian uh, faced these uh, in his own particular way uh, as in the effort to reclaim God's favor. Uh, and he did this by uh, constructing newer, bigger, brighter, and higher churches. Uh, and in particular, uh, the one of those churches, which you see in the image behind me, uh, the Church of the Hagia Sophia, or Holy Wisdom, which served as the cathedral church of his capital city, Constantinople, uh, which is today Istanbul. Uh, that church uh, was built in a time of great upheaval uh, in the aftermath of a, a, a great plague, which had begun uh, according to contemporary historians in Egypt uh, and spread uh, quickly to the coasts of the entire Mediterranean Sea, to the most well-populated cities, and then inland from there. 
uh, most scholars today believe that that plague was in fact the Black Plague, uh, Yersinia pestis, uh, and that it was the first time that it had come uh, into not just the Mediterranean, but also into the cities of the Roman Empire. Uh, now, it was a time when uh, the plague was not necessarily uh, the number one concern for the Emperor Justinian or the Roman Empire as a whole. It was also a time of great external conflict uh, where war was raging between the uh, Roman Empire and the Persian Empire to the east, as well as with uh, Vandal and Gothic tribesmen uh, who had settled down in the cities of both North Africa and Italy. Uh, but uh, there was also internal conflict, uh, and in fact, um, the provocation for the building of the Hagia Sophia was not just uh, the problem of plague, but also the internal uh, rioting, uh, which had caused the uh, existing Basilica Church to be burned down uh, at the hands of, of the rioters. Um, but uh, Justinian uh, faced all of this uh, according to uh, Procopius, who wrote an uh, extensive account praising Justinian and also other accounts critiquing him. Uh, Justinian responded by hiring two of the uh, most well-educated builders and architects that he could find, uh, Anthemius of Tralles and Isidore of Miletus. Uh, and then he also called in Isidore's son uh, as well, Isidore the Younger, because the great dome that you see behind me was actually uh, raised uh, in 562 uh, and rededicated in 562 because the first dome uh, fell down in an earthquake uh, only about uh, uh, 20 years after it was finished. Uh, this second dome, though, stood up uh, and it endured. And now we'll go inside the building. Uh, if I can get this to work, there we go. Uh, and see uh, the grandeur um, of this structure, uh, even in a time of great warfare, uh, of rioting uh, and of plague. Uh, this is the kind of architecture that uh, Justinian uh, got his architects to erect. Uh, it uh, uh, took the first uh, rebuilding five years, and then after the earthquake, the second rebuilding uh, took another five years. Uh, but once it was up, uh, it stayed up. Uh, and we have uh, not only the account of Procopius, but also a large number of historians and poets uh, expressing their great uh, delight at this construction. Um, Paul the Silentiary, for example, uh, in his rededication poem, speaks of how this uh, dome is like a helmet, rounded on all sides, rising above the viewer, bestriding the roof of the church. And at its very summit, art has depicted the cross, the protector of the city. Uh, it is a wonder to see how this dome, wide below, gradually grows less at the top as it rises. And at the very navel, the sign of the cross is depicted in a circle by means of the minute mosaic tiles so that the savior of the whole world may forever protect the church. And at the base, there are 40 arched windows through which the rays of golden haired dawn are channeled in the morning. Uh, so in poetry, uh, as in architecture, uh, the response um, to plague and riot in 6th century Byzantium was uh, to look to both uh, the poetic tradition and, uh, more importantly, to what would please God. Uh, and it was believed that what would please God was bigger, higher, more brightly lit uh, uh, buildings where the services might be held. Uh, Procopius, interestingly, says, why would this please God? Because it would be a dwelling place uh, for him. Uh, so they were not entirely divorced from the idea of the temple, we can see uh, as well.
that's uh, um, what I wanted to say for my brief presentation. And I look forward to uh, answering some questions and continuing the discussion. Right. Thank you, uh, uh, Amelia. Well, that, that kicks us off uh, marvelously when we think about, you know, what was the response to plague? Well, it's to build, you know, one of the, I guess, you know, arguably one of the most important uh, buildings in, in, in Christendom and, uh, uh, you know, still an extraordinary uh, uh, feat of architectural uh, brilliance today. Um, Right. Well, you've given us, I think, a good taste of uh, the challenges we're setting ourselves in terms of how we're going to respond uh, to COVID-19. Um, to continue the discussion, uh, it's now my <coughs> great pleasure uh, to invite our second speaker to give uh, us a few uh, thoughts, and that is uh, Dr. Beth Spacey. Uh, Dr. Spacey is a postdoctoral researcher here in the School of Historical and Philosophic Inquiry. Uh, she's a historian of medieval Europe, specializing uh, in the Crusades of the late uh, 11th to the late 13th century. Um, in particular, she works on medieval narratives of the Crusades written by Latin Christian uh, Europeans. Um, and indeed, I can even put in a plug for a new book, uh, which is uh, very, very exciting. Uh, um, this is her book, The Miraculous and the Writing of Crusade Narrative, uh, which came out just in March this year. Um, so, Dr. Spacey will be presenting to us on how uh, the world was changed uh, by uh, the, the Black Death. So, without further ado, I'll hand over to uh, Beth now. Thank you, Alistair, uh, and thank you everyone for coming along this evening. So, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we know about uh, European Latin Christian responses to what is uh, now called the Second Great Plague Pandemic. And these are outbreaks of the bacterium Yersinia pestis uh, among human populations across Afro-Eurasia uh, in the later Middle Ages. So its initial and most damaging wave in Europe and the Mediterranean is commonly known as the Black Death. Um, this is a later name and this took place between 1347 and 1353 and it killed an estimated 40 to 60 percent of affected populations. Before I dive in, um, I did just want to uh, note that this is a really lively area of scholarship um, at the moment, especially since 2011, when the full um, genome of Yersinia pestis was reconstructed. Um, so since then, the shape of plague studies has changed in really quite exciting ways, um, geographically, chronologically, methodologically. Um, and if you're interested, I would encourage anyone to check out uh, a recording of a webinar that was held by the Medieval Academy of America uh, last month called The Mother of All Pandemics. It brought together um, some of these brilliant scholars um, to discuss the state of the field. For my part, I'm going to talk about uh, three examples of iconic uh, artistic and literary Western European responses uh, and dig a little bit into what they can tell us. Um, so, I think even now in the throes of COVID-19, it's difficult for us to imagine the sudden death of 40 to 60% of the population within a space of two years. Um, and to appreciate the sort of pressures that these might have put on people emotionally, socially, economically, etc. Sources suggest that most medieval Christians believe that the plague outbreak was a form of divine punishment for the sins of humankind. Um, and one manifestation of this can be seen in anxieties about mortality, um, about being prepared in this life uh, for your, the well-being of your soul after death. Um, alongside some reflection on the corruptibility of the flesh uh, and the incorruptibility of the soul. And this is not new. This, you know, the church has been urging people to think about their priorities in life and their immortal souls long before the Black Death. Um, but what we do see uh, is what Rosemary Horrocks has called an obsessive emphasis on the corruption of the body, juxtaposed with the pride and complacency of the living. So uh, one or two examples of this. Just... So here on the screen are two images um, of two transi tombs, what we call transi tombs from England. This is a form of, uh, this is a form of cadaver tomb. Um, where you get the more common effigy depicting the person sort of in quiet repose at the top in all their finery and then below that you get a really quite gruesome depiction um, of the cadaver in a stage of decomposition 
And we begin to see these types of effigy cropping up from the late 14th century, so after the initial uh, plague outbreak. But then it's worth noting that there were recurrent waves of plague, uh, pretty much for every decade, for over a generation after the initial one. The other example I wanted to show you here, uh, imagery like that of the Dance of Death and of the Three Living and the Three Dead. Um, both of which centre on the idea that we are all equal in the face of death, uh, whatever our station had been in life. Um, and this on the slide here is an early 16th century panel. This one is again from England. You've got your fabulously dressed young gentleman on the right in red here with a very large bag of money um, and a skeleton offering, a rather cute skeleton offering him a flower here. Again, these themes existed before the Black Death, but they do seem to increase in popularity after the first plague outbreak. I think we can gain a better insight into the connection between the increase in popularity of these sorts of themes and the impact of plague when we turn to uh, a masterful text called the Decameron uh, by the Italian writer and humanist Giovanni Boccaccio. Um, so this is a work of fiction set in Florence. I won't go into it too much, but essentially uh, there's a description of the Black Death in Florence. Ten people uh, disappear to a villa uh, for ten days where they tell a hundred stories. So uh, the book's introduction contains a really quite confronting and highly descriptive account of pestilence's symptoms, attempted treatment and broader impact in Florence. Uh, the abandonment of loved ones, um, the moment that they first got their symptoms, the breakdown in proper burial practices. Um, so in other words, the narrative passes from what makes really quite difficult reading in the, in the introduction to a series of highly entertaining, comedic, uh, at times tragic, stories about love, sex, greed, ingenuity. Um, and these take place in a sort of serene Eden-like villa um, which are all the more poignant when set against the, the grim description of the plague-stricken city. So, in short, I think Boccaccio's stories of human ingenuity are set in a world before plague, um, but you have to get past his sort of grim stories about the Black Death first to get to those. And it's his accountment of the treatment of the dead, the anonymity of mass graves, bodies in the street, all this sort of really quite confronting material, I think helps us to better understand um, the anxieties about mortality and pride that we're seeing in the sorts of mortuary architecture and artwork uh, that I also um, showed you a moment ago. Okay, thanks. Okay. Well, well th thank you, Beth. Again, it's lovely to see um, more things added on to our, our discussion and uh, our table. Amelia gave us, you know, a masterpiece of architecture. You've shown us the way that, you know, plague has led to, you know, masterpieces of literature like, you know, Boccaccio's Decameron, and as well as art that makes us rethink about, uh, make us rethink about our place in the world and uh, um, our relationship uh, to it. Well, um, the final person uh, to add to our feast uh, is, um, Dr. Karen Selberg. Uh, uh, Dr. Selberg is a literary scholar and a uh, cultural historian, uh, again based in the School of Historical and Philosophic Inquiry. Um, her research interests are wide and varied, uh, but it's really her expertise in early modern medicine um, and ideas of the body and embodiment uh, that make her, I think, such a valuable uh, contributor to tonight's discussion. Um, Karen will be talking in particular about uh, a uh, uh, plague in the early modern period. So uh, uh, again, I, I'll hand over to Karen. I should also put out that Karen is back joining us from Sweden uh, uh, as, uh, as well. So uh, we're delighted that uh, uh, she's able to join us um, uh, for, for this seminar. Thank you, Alistair, and thank you everyone for joining again. It's, it's a, we've had some really, really great examples so far. I'm now going to turn to another outbreak of the plague, although I say another outbreak, it's actually a, a continuation of the same strain of plague that Beth was talking about. We usually say that uh, the, the, the Black Death um, uh, stayed in Europe until well into the, uh, well into the 18th century. Uh, and, but the, the outbreak I'm, I'm going to talk about is one of the most famous and one of the most serious later outbreaks of the same strain, and that's the, uh, the Great Plague in London. 
And uh, this took place over the years 1665 and 1666. And about one fourth of, of the population of London at that time is thought to have died. It's a little bit unsure. I mean, we'd, we, have, uh, we have just under, under 70,000 uh, people recorded dead uh, of plague at this time. But um, most historians would say that it's more like 100,000 out of a population of, uh, of um, between 400 and 460,000 people in London. And then this particular plague also spread all over England to a bunch of uh, other big cities, but also to smaller communities. In the same kind of way that things have spread during the COVID outbreak now, it's mainly through trade and through travel. And it was very hard to contain these kind of outbreaks. So I'm going to give you some pictures of um, uh, some of the kind of um, uh, interesting artistic um, uh, artistic uh, sort of responses to this. Okay, I'm hoping that this is working. Um, so um, uh, so uh, here's another one of the, these kind of depictions of the dance of death. It's, it was a very, very popular kind of theme. Uh, throughout these periods, and one of the best um, one of the best uh, uh, sources we have for uh, for kind of getting some sort of an understanding of what this plague outbreak in London was like is uh, the diaries of of Samuel Pepys. Pepys is most probably most famous uh, for being a member a member of Parliament and uh, the the secretary to the Admiralty. But in, he's also a very important source for, for historians and literary historians of the 17th century because he kept a diary um, pretty much every day throughout his life and recorded everything that was happening. And um, his uh, account of the plague diary or, or, or of the plague outbreak in, in London is one of my favorites, uh, mainly because it's so immediate. He's writing about it as it's happening. And um, as, as we're reading Peep's diaries, we can see that as it started, he was a little bit worried about it. The plague is here again. Uh, oh, more and more houses are boarded up. Uh, and, and he gets more and more worried as it goes along. So he sends his wife and his kids uh, to the countryside, as a lot of other uh, richer people did at this time. And, uh, and then he himself stays in the city. But the, one of the things I find the most interesting is that when you come to the end of Peep's um, when you come to the end of Pepys' uh, account, um, he um, he turns away from um, uh, he 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 doesn't just talk about the horror that he's seen around it or, or seen around him. But one of the main things that he's commenting on is the great merriment that he's experienced during this time. He says that indeed he's never actually experienced greater merriment in his life, and um, and he 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 almost mourns the passing of the plague. Um, and um, and saying that there's there's, there's there's a kind of immediateness to this period where every where you kind of always lived in the present it was like a type of extended present every day uh, every day presented something new and you couldn't really look to the future and I think this is interesting because I mean when Alistair was talking about how to find the extraordinary rather than just going back to the ordinary after this or I was going to call COVID a plague outbreak, but after this pandemic, I mean, I think I think these are some these are things that people were talking about already then. Um, uh, just to give you some sort of an idea, also, this is also one of the very first times where we got um, uh, where we got uh, 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 like uh, some sort of medical statistics showing, and that's another thing that people. of all the deaths in the par parishes uh, um, published. So people were constantly reading these, uh, these medical statistics. And if you look at this picture I've put up here, the, uh, they, they've, they've listed all the various illnesses that people die from. And uh, obviously the most common one is plague, which is here 7,165 in one week. This was obviously incredibly uh, frightening to read this, but I, but, but, Peeps specifically talks about it as a calming element as well. It, it made you feel like you have some sort of a control and some sense of uh, some sense of knowledge of what was actually happening in you, in your parish. So uh, 
I mean, PEEPS is one of the best, one of the best examples we have of kind of an immediate uh, sort of response to the plague. But there's also been lots of stories coming out of this period, and particularly about uh, some very heroic communities, or uh, we tend to refer to them as plague villages. Um, I think pr probably the most famous one is the little northern English city of Eam. Uh, where as the plague was coming into the city um, through a bale of cloth uh, that was delivered from London, uh, the, the uh, people started getting sick and dying. When this happened, the rector of the, of the community, Reverend William Montpesson, and together with uh, the previous minister who had been ejected for being a Puritan, Thomas Stanley, the two of them got together and decided we need to keep the people within the city limits. We need to quarantine our community so that this plague doesn't spread to all the adjoining communities around us. So they pretty much spoke to the population and, and said, we need to be heroic now. We need to, we need to stand up for, uh, for, for, for the people around us. And we need to, we need, we, we can't flee this plague infested village. We need to live with this and we need to make sure that no one else gets affected. So they quarantined the community and shut themselves off. And um, the stories vary a little bit, as, as Beth was saying, you know, these kind of accounts, uh, especially when you start talking about when, when people are starting making up, you know, hero heroic poems and, and writing heroic kind of uh, narratives about this place, obviously, the numbers go up and down. But um, it's, it's possibly uh, anything from about one third of the population to half of the population died. The church uh, records 273 individuals out of, um, out of a possible somewhere around 600 to 800 people living in the community. Um, and uh, so, I mean, it was, they took a very big hit but uh, the, the adjoining villages around Eam also did suffer a lot less than many other communities in England. So they, it really did make a difference. Uh, interestingly, um, there's, I mean, there's been, there's a bunch of, um, there's a bunch of um, uh, kind of, uh, there's, there's a museum in Eam, there's a bunch of uh, poems written, as I was saying, songs, plays, novels. Um, but I, I, I would say possibly, um, uh, uh, I mean, most of these things were written quite considerably uh, later than, than, the actual, um, than the actual event. And I'm going to read for you just, just a little section of, um, of uh, the poem by, um, by uh, um, Mary Howitt. Um, it's a 19th century poem um, written in, um, written in 18, 1827. And uh, just to get, get a set, just so that you get a sense of, of, of the kind of the type of heroism that, that was being expressed. She writes that, yet on through all unfearing and un unharmed, Montpesson and his Catherine had sped, that's the reverend and his wife. As God's peculiar grace, their frames had charmed from the plague's might, the dying and the dead, the fear sick heart, the wretch from whom had fled in his delirious fury all beside. They sought, they soothed, and holy comfort shed, or the last boon to mortal need supplied, scattering through that thick gloom a heavenly light as wide. O patriots pure, O virtue crowned pair, gray eld than yours can boast no nobler name. Time has shown glorious spirits which could dare death for their country in the hour of fame. So this, I mean, the people who died in Eam became heroes. And I find this particularly interesting because of, we, we're talking now about how to, like new ways of becoming a hero in the COVID epidemic. Here in Sweden, we've had a bunch of, a, a bunch of uh, advertising campaigns talking about how this is the first time in history that you, that you can become a hero by just, by just sitting at, at home in your sofa and watching Netflix and doing nothing. Interestingly, the heroism that was being uh, talked about during this uh, plague outbreak in England in the 17th century was also a kind of passive heroism. It's the heroism where you stay at home, you stay in your community, and you you don't go out, you don't spread the plague. 
rather you 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 take what's coming to you and you protect the people around you and i think i'm going to finish there and so that alistair can open up to discussion right well thank you karen I, i'm particularly uh, fond of this idea of the stay-at-home hero who uh, uh serves their community by uh lying on a sofa and watching netflix it sounds kind of uh, uh fantastic and again great to see the kind of various ranges of responses to you know that enjoy the moment that we see uh with samuel peeps and uh, um the kind of idea of in, in learning how to enjoy the now and i think you know many of us um you know will return uh, to our workplaces with a sense of mixed feeling. I think, you know, um, you know, being uh, in isolation has been also a time of self-reflection, um, uh, a time of, in some cases, self-improvement. Uh, you know, the opportunity to revisit uh, Boccaccio's Decameron, for example, has been a greater uh, uh, pleasure of, uh, of mine. So, um, so we, we've got a lot of uh, questions uh, from the audience and, uh, and some uh, ideas that I want to uh, uh, pick up on. Um, I might actually start with some of the uh, questions from the audience, um, and in particular, I guess one of the things that's come through is, is an interest in the kind of uh, biological pathogens that we're talking about. Um, uh, and in particular, I guess, um, a sense, first of all, um, if you could give us an idea, Amelia, uh, about the, the, the effect of the Justinianic plague, how, how big are we talking about, what kinds of casualty figures. Um, and then there's also been some interest, uh, uh, Beth, in um, particularly the kind of 2011 um, work done on um, sequencing the genome for um, Black Death, and if you could say a bit more about that. But um, first of all, Amelia, if you could give us a sense of um, what, you know, what was the just Justinianic plague like? Right, well, um, our best description of the Justinianic plague comes from Procopius's Wars, um, book uh, uh, two, section 22, and there uh, he basically talks about fever and then buboes in the um, underarms and, and the groin. So this has caused uh, most modern uh, scholars uh, to think that it was Yersinia pestis, that it was in fact the Black Plague or Black Death, uh, and that it had come, uh, you know, via uh, 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 the Nile and trade up the Nile from, from Central Africa. Um, but uh, uh, it was only found in actual um, plague graves uh, about, I think, about 10 to 20 years ago um, in uh, northern Italy, uh, in some of the cities of northern Italy. So uh, that's uh, uh, how it was confirmed as, as having been, uh, in fact, um, you know, bubonic plague, basically. And roughly what, what, what kind of percentage of the population was, well, was wiped out, do we know? Uh, yes, there's still enormous, uh, enormous uh, challenges in reconstructing that. Uh, you know, we, we, we have much better data for the, the uh, 17th and for the 14th century than we do for the century. Uh, we don't know how many people it killed. Uh, Procopius says uh, that it started with just a few in Constantinople. Uh, and then it, it went up till there were 5,000 or even 10,000 dying per day um, during the, uh, the three months that uh, it, uh, it first struck in that city in the year 542. So uh, if, uh, you know, if we can believe him and he was there, uh, then uh, that means that, you know, they were losing thousands of people a day um, and uh, that uh, that was a serious uh, blow to the, the city's population. Uh, we can tell that uh, big parts of the city were turned over to agriculture, um, to uh, vineyards and market gardens and that sort of thing in subsequent years, uh, and that uh, there was a, a, a dramatic population decline in most large cities of the Roman Empire in that era uh, as well. Um, uh, so uh, this, uh, this is only documented though in actual numbers or statistics in Egypt where we have the papyri uh, and there you can actually see wages rising um, as a result of a, a loss of, of manpower but whether we're talking about you know a half or a quarter um, you know or, or a lower number that's it's very much debated. Right great thank you that's very helpful for giving us a sense of uh, what what life was like during the Justinianic plague. Um, uh, Beth, perhaps you could talk to us about Black Death. What's the latest? 
Oh yeah, wow, so much uh, has happened uh, in the last 10 years with uh, Black Death Scholarship. Um, and I guess that one of the best summaries of those uh, advances that you can uh, get hold of if you're interested is by Monica Green um, in, I think, a 2014 uh, special issue of the Medieval Globe called Pandemic Disease in the Medieval World. But one of the main events, um, I think, was in 2011 when, um, uh, I'll take a step back. So uh, trying to reconstruct ancient DNA um, of Yersinia, Yersinia pestis uh, has proved incredibly hard because it's something that's only in the bloodstream for a few days before death, so it doesn't show up um, you know, in bones. So if you go to skeletal remains uh, to try and access this sort of information, it's just not there. However, it was discovered that you can actually uh, get hold of some of um, this information from dental pulp, uh, which they were able to extract from a uh, known plague burial site in East Smithfield in London from the period of the Black Death. And from there onwards, they were able to make some uh, really uh, quite incredible advances um, that I think have um, pretty much um, sealed off the debate about whether the Black Death was Yersinia pestis or not. Um, another fascinating thing about this finding was that um, Yersinia pestis exists today and the uh, in in uh, various sort of rodent reservoirs around the world and um the genome as it exists now isn't actually that different from the one that they sequenced um, from uh, medieval samples so that has all sorts of implications um that have been explored as well um so but that was the the main event in 2011 there right well thank you very much beth that's really uh, fascinating um some uh, we've had some questions that are interested in perhaps the darker side of the wake of plague. So uh, we've been, of course, talking about the very positive things to emerge in the wake of plague. But people have been interested in the slightly darker side. In particular, some people have asked about, for example, the increased fear of God that emerged uh, in the wake of the plague. Um, other people have asked about um, scapegoating. Were particular groups or minorities uh, identified uh, during the plague? And indeed. Um, uh, some people have uh, asked also whether there were um, any anti um, uh, any anti quarantine people. Were there people who rebelled against the idea of being locked up in their plague village um, uh, and uh, uh, went out uh, uh, and uh, escaped? So, um, so perhaps if I could turn over to the panel and just uh, ask you to talk very briefly uh, about you know um, perhaps some of the negative consequences uh, uh, that that we're we're seeing in the wake of in the wake of plague just in terms of, of balance it's not all uh uh cathedrals and uh um, yeah. merriment no I, I think um uh, i want to particularly uh, say thanks to han for the question about what role did fear play uh, and as far as justinian was concerned the best defense was a good offense so um procopius tells us that he deliberately decided to attack persia uh, as a way um, to basically keep his own troops active and outside of the city uh, and on the move, uh, and because he thought, you know, that Persia might be weaker than usual. Uh, so, uh, um, uh, but uh, there was also kind of internal fears uh, in that uh, when the rumors spread that Justinian might be dead, uh, Belisarius and um, um, Buzes, who were both the uh, top generals, um, were supposedly caught, uh, you know, chatting about who would be the best next emperor. Uh, and thus the Empress Theodora uh, imprisoned one of them for two years in her dungeon uh, and sent the other one uh, from the Persian front to the Italian front as a, as a punishment, um, basically. So uh, 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 Procopius, though, says, you know, fear God, don't fear the plague, um, and, you know, try and um, uh, uh, not, uh, you know, worry about uh, it too much. Um, try, to, uh, uh, try to be a better person and thus, you know, recover the goodwill of God um, in, that, in that way. Um, but uh, that was a kind of a conventional way, though, of talking about the divine. Uh, which we find in, in Procopius, in Malalast, in you know, many different chroniclers and poets. Uh, and it's often um, trying to uh, um, you know, untangle that can be difficult.
Uh, Beth, would you like to? Yeah, um, firstly, on uh, the issue of um, whether people didn't do what they were told uh, or, and didn't uh, m maintain quarantine and those sort of things. Boccaccio has a, an excellent uh, story where he basically says some people you know, withdrew and some people really just decided to live it up um, in, response, uh, in response to the plague um, or move out. Um, but he then sort of sort of wryly says as if they could outrun the punishment of God. Um, in terms of scapegoating and persecution, yes, um, some very important examples after the first wave, the Black Death, even within um, 1348, so very early, we have um, the persecution of Jewish communities across um, what is now Germany, France, Italy and Spain. Um, so the theory was, uh, the story was that uh, Jewish people, there was uh, a conspiracy whereby Jewish people were poisoning the wells and that's what was causing the plague. Um, now Pope Clement VI did point out that if that was their plan, it wasn't a very clever one because Jewish people were also dying of the plague. So you've got um, localized, well, localized episodes of violence but <laughs> across uh, these areas that are not necessarily coming from the peasantries these are quite well organized um, in, in some instances it's local councils uh, deciding to uh, torture and execute uh, Jewish men women and children um, and then you also have the Pope trying to exercise a bit of control over this and say you know um, this is Entirely unnecessary. Okay, thank you. Uh, Karen, do you uh, want to t tell us about, were, were there any people who tried to, tried to escape Ian? Uh, that's actually a really interesting question. So this is the reason why, this is the reason why uh, uh, the Reverend uh, Montpesson was, was quite new and uh, he wasn't very popular when he came into, when he came into the community, mainly because a lot of people had stood behind the previous uh, minister who, who had been ousted for being a Puritan, Thomas Stanley, being a Puritan and he also was on the side of, um, of Cromwell. So, so um, Mompesson actually had to go and speak to Stanley and, uh, and get Stanley on his side in order to get people to comply. And uh, I mean, it was, he, he did manage to get them to agree to compliance. Uh, but uh, interestingly, in all these heroic narratives, people keep talking about, oh, the heroism of Montpesson and his wife. I feel, I, I feel in, in a lot of the poems, um, I, I feel like the, the, the actual people who, um, who stood by them and agreed to, um, uh, and agreed to, uh, to quarantine are at least as heroic. <laughs> um, um, but, but it's, it, it's the, 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 the kind of the, the discourses of heroism have surrounded the, the leaders. Um, but um, this, most of the stories do talk, uh, mainly talk about how, just how brave it was to stay there. And uh, um, I mean, apparently most of the people did stay there. Um, I'd also like to actually add a little bit to this idea of, of persecution because it's interesting. I mean, the, the, the early modern uh, uh, persecution that, that continued, I mean, it continued on really from the Black Death and, um, and in communities throughout Europe. And you had, yes, Jews were still being, uh, were still being persecuted, but also Romanis, pilgrims, lepers. As uh, people who suffered from acne or psoriasis, but then one of the more uh, one of the more um, a kind of acknowledged uh, kind of uh, sets of persecution were of witches because they they believed that witches had um, had uh, bestowed plague on communities. And um, for those of you who are interested in uh, in um, uh, other kinds of uh, other kinds of populations in Europe as well. I mean, some of the people who, who or some of the creatures that suffered the worst persecutions were actually dogs during this time. Um, uh, in London, for example, in 1592, the mayor uh, proclaimed that all, all dogs that ran stray on the streets would have to be killed immediately because they, they believed that dogs carried uh, the pestilence. Also cats were, were, were killed in large numbers in communities. And, um, and it, it's kind of like anything, like animals, um, travelers, 
and people who seem who were a little bit different in the community. Um, uh, 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 older kind of women in some communities when, when it was uh, questions of witchcraft. I mean, anything that was a little bit scary or other, uh, uh, kind of th those kind of fears came to the forefront during this time. Mm. Thank you. Um, that, that's really uh, fascinating and, I mean, in some sense troubling to see the way in which kind of there's the, a, a continued continuity um, uh, within this kind of scapegoating and, and persecution. I mean, um, EEM, of course, still um, continues to fascinate even today. Um, uh, one of the uh, our correspondents here has uh, pointed out that Geraldine Brooks' Years of Wonder, uh, uh, the Year of Wonders, uh, was uh, um, precisely set in this uh, extraordinary uh, mm. place and uh, place and time. Um, there's been some discussion uh, in the chat on uh, the, the religious impact of this, and uh, um, and I guess this is kind of interesting because these days, you know, we see plague and we think, you know, how can uh, God allow this to occur? Um, where of course the early modern response is, you know, what have we done that God is sending this down upon us? And so it's been, I think, a, an interesting religious shift in the way in which we uh, correlate God and plague. Um, and I'd be interested to, to hear um, uh, about um, the religiosity in the wake of plague. Um, uh, are we seeing people going to, uh, um, uh, going to church more often? Do we see, um, we see obviously the building of uh, tremendous uh, religious institutions. Um, would uh, people like to comment? Well, I could, I could just add, since you just mentioned Ian there, um, they, they did ha hold uh, uh, very frequent uh, uh, kind of gatherings, uh, religious gatherings in Ian uh, throughout this plague period uh, outside. So, so they had sermons outside. And it's really interesting to see, actually, um, they, 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 they had very strict rules on how you were allowed to gather for these sermons. You had to stand in your little family groups. Uh, so uh, in, 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 in the kind of uh, pictures from this time, it looks quite similar, actually, to the, to the kind of rules we have surrounding social distancing to, uh, right now. This kind of idea that you stay in your family group, but it's still really important to get together and to, and, and, and to, to think about these kind of spiritual issues. So it was, it was one of the things that was, that was emphasized in, in, in EM during this period. Yes. Uh, Beth, how, how are people reacting religiously in, to, to Black Death? Uh, in various ways. Um, uh, pretty much straight off the bat in England, when it arrived um, in 1348, there were high-ranking churchmen calling for regular weekly uh, processions um, for sort of targeted liturgy and sermons um, to try to um, bring people to, together to appease God. Um, there were other more um, extreme expressions of this, so there was the flagellant movement um, of people who would uh, congregate publicly and, uh, and engage in a, a more extreme version of penance um, however, I mean, the church was initially uh, on board with, uh, with this, but they it quickly became clear that they were a little too extreme in the sense that uh, they were starting to criticise the church. Um, what else do we have? Um, there was a question about um, the religious sculptures, uh, and um, these were usually uh, wealthy individuals who could afford to have these sorts of uh, items commissioned in order that they could have prayer said for them, that they might be remembered. I think in the face of the great anonymity of that mortality. Um, so that was the, the sort of religious angle there. Um, so okay. yeah, multiple ways, yeah. Multiple, multiple ways, yes. Uh, 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 Amelia, do you have anything to say in terms of the religious life in, in Byzantium? Mm -hmm. Well, um, uh, it's hard to say how much more religious things were after the plague, uh, because it was already uh, um, uh, a place, uh, a society, where the church had been gaining power steadily for about 300 years and uh, was um, very powerful already. Uh, so uh, it did perhaps um, give 
the church and the bishop of Constantinople in particular a bit more authority vis-a-vis uh, -vis his relationship to the emperor, um, that being Justinian, and to the, the imperial um, power. Uh, that uh, may be why um, Justinian took such an active role in the construction of Hagia Sophia uh, and wanted to be seen to take such an active role. Uh, it's uh, uh, also uh, interesting that you see people going to a number of uh, churches that are specifically connected with healing, uh, notably uh, St. Diomedes um, and uh, uh, the various churches devoted to the Virgin Mary, um, uh, particularly Mary as the, the source of the life-giving spring. So uh, you do have a kind of growth in um, attendance at those churches, a patronage of those churches um, that are, are seen to have a kind of healing role. Um, uh, but, uh, but there also does seem to be, at least in Prokofiev, some skepticism about experts and uh, expert advice um, and you know, what can science, what can medicine uh, do um, uh, since it, it hasn't been able to come up with anything uh, to treat this, uh, even uh, as it recurred uh, and it came back in, you know, uh, in waves every sort of uh, four uh, years or so, or, um, you know, in, in, uh, uh, in most of the major cities. Okay, fascinating. Thank you. Yes. Uh, look, we're, we're coming close to the end of our session today. Um, the Australian response to uh, COVID-19 has been to give us $25,000 to um, update our homes, improve our bathrooms. Um, is this really the best that we can do? Um, is this the legacy that we want to leave for uh, future generations is better tapware? Um, uh, if you had to give some advice about what, in fact, um, what infrastructure spend or what Australia should be doing uh, in response to COVID-19, um, what, what would your advice be? Um, wow. Any... <laughs> <laughs> wow, gosh. Uh, well, I think, you know, trying to learn from the past, I mean, not just Procopius, but his precedent, Thucydides, uh, both of them as historians uh, said, uh, let's, uh, uh, record this as much as we can so that uh, if it comes again and again it can be recognized uh, and both you know helpful and unhelpful responses can be uh, you know um, calculated uh, so i would say you know to to try and uh, understand what's going on um, right now and who is actually doing what uh, in a uh, um, you know in a future uh, setting would be good Beth, we should all be building mortuary chapels? Yeah, well, I guess the, the key difference here is that these were mostly privately funded um, initiatives. One that is interesting um, is the uh, coming together of uh, a guild or fraternity in Cambridge in response to the Black Death, and they um, set up uh, Corpus Christi College. And it was... Uh, the only sort of uh, townspeople funded college at that university. So um, contemporaries were seeing that um, um, investment in education, uh, I think in this case, mainly education of the clergy, because of course your priests and your clerics are dying of plague too. Um, and education is becoming poorer as, as, a, as, a response, uh, as a result of that. So I think um, perhaps there are lessons to be learned there. Investment in higher education, absolutely, absolutely. love it. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> I'm not biased. <laughs> Karen. Um, uh... oh, I wish I had an example as good as that. <laughs> That's great. Well, no, but it, one thing that really happened in response to the various plague outbreaks throughout Europe was um, an, a renewed interest in, in ideas of hygiene and, uh, and medical knowledge surrounding uh, the spread of disease. So pretty much it, for, for, for most of the big pl plague outbreaks in, throughout Europe, there were a number of uh, kind of plague tracts uh, published. And these plague tracts laid out new theories of exactly what's happening in, in, the, in these kind of arena, arenas and ex exactly what the new kind of thought was surrounding how to keep a hygienic uh, environment. And I mean, those, obviously, obviously there, uh, some of those, uh, some of those uh, 
tracks with kind of repetitions of things that have been said many times before. But there were a lot of new kind of uh, ideas coming around about um, about yeah, you shouldn't you shouldn't share objects. You 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 need to be really careful with objects coming from uh, from some from a home where there's been. Uh, plague deaths. They talked about how to keep the air kind of clean and safe. For them, keeping the air clean, because they, I mean, they didn't know about bacteria yet. They kept talking about the kind of the bad miasma in the air. For them, it meant kind of avoiding foul smells. They, they, for example, they said that you shouldn't boil cabbage or onion because that smells bad and that can, that, that, that's sickly. But I mean, there are things that we can look at and think, think of as a bit, you know, weird now and a bit funny, but there were also some really, really big, uh, uh, big kind of uh, advancements through every kind of plague outbreak. And, you know, people, they were building better homes uh, with, uh, with, uh, with kind of sounder, conditions i mean it kind of gave the communities a bit of a push to uh, to, to to think about these things and to to upgrade <laughs> the kind of uh, the, the the kind of systems they had in place and i think sometimes we need a bit of a reminder that uh, that we need to keep alert to uh, to to the health and hygiene of of populations and indeed I mean, the parallels today where you know i think in australia we're, we're set for perhaps the mildest flu season um uh because we've all uh had immunization because we're all madly washing our hands because we're all uh standing uh, apart from each other so the the covid 19 effect um uh, has been had a sort of a, a number effect on other kind of health issues so um thank you well look it's just gone seven o'clock that unfortunately brings uh this seminar to an end but um uh, I'd like to thank everyone uh, online for their questions. There were so many, we never really got a chance to just scratch the surface of them. But thank you very much for your participation in uh, this evening's seminar. And uh, thank you to uh, our, our speakers for presenting uh, such wonderful information and for uh, sharing their knowledge with us. Thank you, Alistair. <laughs> thank you, Alistair. Thank you, and thanks to the organisers and for everyone coming. Mm.